Hello and welcome to Questioning Christianity. My name is Krish Kandaya and I'm delighted that today we're going to be talking through some huge issues together. We want this to be a safe place for a dangerous conversation and we've got an amazing panel of people that are going to help us walk through these issues. Let's meet them now. Hi, I'm Andy Flanagan and uh, I'm a singer-songwriter, worship leader that also dabbles quite a lot in politics and one of my prime passions is to see a just rewiring of the global economic system. Uh, I'm Tiffany Bueller, uh, Managing Director of David's Tent, a worship and prayer movement that has a festival every year. And I'm the mom of three beautiful daughters and a happy wife to my wonderful husband, Justin. Fantastic. <laughs> do you have beautiful children as well? I do, four of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name's Scott McNamara. Uh, yeah, I'm married to a beautiful wife with four beautiful kids. Um, I'm a full-time evangelist. I pioneer a tool called Jesus at the Door, which is to help equip, enable, and, and uh, empower uh, just believers, really, just to get out the building and, and have a go at this thing. Brilliant, Scott. Good to meet you. Hi, and I'm Debbie Harvey, wife, mother, uh, local churchgoer, ministry leader, um, but also I love to dabble in uh, study, in theology, behavioural science, and uh, whatever takes my fancy, really. So the big question we're going to be wrestling with is salvation. Is it true that once saved, always saved? Now, again, this might be a live question for you. Maybe you're not sure uh, about your own soul. You know, are you feeling confident that if you were to die, you would be meeting Jesus, that your sins are forgiven and that you would enter into the new heavens and the new earth? Well, maybe you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you're someone exploring the Christian faith and you want to know, how can I be put in a right relationship with God? Uh, or maybe you're someone that's pretty certain you know what's going to happen. Well, is that a justified assurance? Or does the scripture actually have some challenging questions for us? This is a big topic, and uh, I'm so delighted we're going to be able to talk about it uh, with our studio guests today. But just so that you know, uh, the Barna Group uh, recently did a study, and only 6% of adult Christians made their decision to follow God over the age of 18. That means 94% of adult Christians made their decision under the age of 18. Let's go to Scott. Scott, a lot of young people there making professions of faith. Um, how can they know that they really are saved? How, how would you help someone know that they can be forgiven by God? That's interesting, just to comment on you on the that statistic I wasn't aware of that because the people I see come to Jesus the, the past few years have been over 18 um, and, and I've, I've seen over 2,000 people on a one-on-one -on -one basis that's over 18 so that's interesting to know just as, as a footnote uh, but yeah how do we know I mean you know people that I work with I, I you know I'm a street evangelist when I pray for individuals to accept the Lord you know I believe in confess with your mouth believe in your heart you'll be saved um, you know that's the beginning of it uh, and then it's that process that needs to be outworked. Uh, I, I, you know, repentance is key in, in any in any evangelistic uh, you know initiative. But I think it's it's an, a thing of the heart, isn't it? Uh, I think what might help be helpful is uh, Billy Graham said this great quote because I know for me and my pastor when we began to see a move of God in our community, we, we nobody was coming to church. We were seeing these people respond initially, and we were like, where are they all? And then my pastor was like, why are they not coming to church? And where are they? And, and, um, I, and, you know, so, so I looked into this a little bit and prayed about it. And, and Billy Graham gave this great quote uh, where he said this. He said, when people respond at my, my crusades, one of four things happens. It's a stage of conception. It's another stage of gestation or it's birth or it's completely spurious. Um, and that's what he found in his crusades. And, and um, you know, I, I kind of found, found that to be the same too. People accept Christ, but there is different stages mm. uh, where those individuals are. And that's why discipleship and, mm. and, and working with people to develop them in their faith. And that's what we began to do. And we began to see many. I mean, I've seen over 300 people that I prayed on the street with wow. come through. Let's come to Andy. Skeptics might say, it's all very well praying for people on the street. Um, are we giving some of them false assurance that they go away and, and think they are reconnected with God, but actually they've just kind of said a prayer that really meant nothing to them. How, how can we know whether we are saved or not? I think it goes back to the question of what, what do you mean by being saved? You know, and I think we spent in the church a long time uh, talking about what we've been saved from, you know, talk of hell and heaven. Uh, but we haven't spent so much talking about what we've been saved to. You know, you could say that maybe for the last 50 years in the church, we've been obsessed with asking the question, what do I need to do to get to heaven? And 
you know, I think that's not necessarily the most helpful question. And but perhaps now we're guilty of answering the question all the time: What do we need to do to sort out the earth? And and for me, the question is maybe both of those questions aren't the right questions. Mm. Maybe maybe the question maybe those are things about function and where we end up mm. and what we want to do. Maybe the question should be more about identity. You know, how do I how do I live with integrity now mm. in light of that perfect future? How do, how do I live well now? How do I live, live in a way that represents how I'm going to live forever? You know, as, as scripture says, we'll be kings and priests reigning with him. So we, how do we start living and reigning with him right now in the here and now? I think that's how we know our salvation is being worked out. Yeah. Rather than the sort of, you know, have I made it across the line? Mm. It's actually, for me, that's at times actually asking the wrong question. There's no, not so much integrity in that question. So Tiffany Andy says we're asking the wrong questions. Mm. Your personal story is one where you were part of a church and then mm. left the church and then came back again. Mm -hmm. How did you know the time you came back again it was real, that this was really a new relationship with God, not just religion? Yeah. I think that I, I personally felt, when I asked Jesus into my life when I was 20 years old, I personally felt like he was there and immediately began speaking to me. And it became a relationship where everything that I did came out of this place of friendship and relationship with the Lord. So the lifestyle I was living was not great. I had to, in essence, work out my salvation, but was very much wanting to be apart from the works mm. side of things because I think even the Lord wanted me to, sh to show me that it wasn't about my works. It was about falling in love with Him mm. and knowing Him and walking with Him. And actually, through His kindness, I was led to repentance. And actually, because He loved me so unconditionally and so beautifully, mm. I no longer wanted to live the lifestyle that I was living. I wanted to live for him. Mm. Does, that, does that make sense? That is helpful. Um, Debbie, let's, let's talk about this a bit. So we don't want to say that there's anything that we do that means that we merit a relationship with God. That would be salvation by work. So it mm. must be grace. But again, the Bible does seem to say that there will be some indicators. So for example, remember Zacchaeus, he goes, up the tree, because he's short, I, I relate to Zacchaeus on a number of <laughs> levels. And um, This level? Goes, yeah, I'm pretty short. That's why my chair's probably propped up a little bit. Um, and Jesus invites himself round to Zacchaeus' house for tea, and that act of hospitality was an act of grace. Um, but then responding to that grace, Zacchaeus then starts sorting out his debts, and he starts yeah. repaying people money. Yeah. And that's when Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Yeah. What do you think? What's the connection between our good deeds and our salvation? Yeah, um, just as you talk, I'm reminded of a scripture in Isaiah. It's one of my favourites, and it talks about that. In God is stored up salvation and wisdom and knowledge. And then it says this, but the fear of God is the key to this treasure. So then it's like, well, what is the fear of God? Now, everyone else who, who knew that Jesus had gone round to Zacchaeus' house, all the religious folk freaked out. Mm. Why? Because they were afraid. They were afraid of what the people would say, what they would think, um, you know, what their peers might say and what they'd be accused of. And I thought there's a massive difference between being afraid of God and the fear of God. Mm. So being afraid of God for me is being afraid of being too close, whereas the fear of God is being afraid you're not close enough. Hmm. You're going to miss something of his heart, of the expression of his face when he hmm. says something to you. And I think that's the experience that Zacchaeus had, hmm. is that he encountered a relationship hmm. with God. And I think, I think even, even in your question still sits within the framing of the narrow definition of salvation, because behind your question is really asking, at what point was he saved, inverted yeah. commas, rather than saying it, it's all of the above. You know, when we talk about salvation being holistic, it's about the transformation yeah. of all of our lives. You know, you look at the situation in the mid-90s in Rwanda, mm. you know, 1992, 93, millions of people were saved mm. in, a, in a big, you know, revival and crusades and stuff like that. Mm. But, you know, just mm. about nine months later, they were all, you know, macheteing each other to death. Mm. So had those people actually been mm. saved? What, what, had a work of transformation actually happened? Or had somebody just put their name on a dotted line somewhere? So this, you know, we have to see salvation as, as you know, as, as an internal transformation. I, I, I find in my work in politics, to try and explain it to folks who aren't believers, I find talking about internal and external transformation really mm. helpful. So that actually, yes, we're being internally transformed, but mm. it has to be connected to external transformation. The two interact with each other, our environment and what's going on inside, and you can't have one without the other. Mm. Mm. That's a really helpful point. Let's pick up on the Rwanda one. I, I was chatting to Antoine Voyatasseri, who's the deputy head of the peace and reconciliation process in uh, Rwanda, and a lovely Christian man. And his comment was exactly as yours was, that, you know, in 1991, 
90% of people in Rwanda claimed Christian faith, mm. uh, which means that when a million people were killed by one another in the ethnic yeah. cleansing, mm. statistically it was Christians killing Christians, people that had mm. prayed the prayer, confessed with their mouth, mm. and yet we're not seeing any evidence of salvation at salvation all. Salvation was a narrow thing, mm. a very narrow thing, rather than something affecting all of your lifestyle. So mm. what does it mean to be saved? What th do we mean? I think it's... it's uh... Predominantly, it is, a, it is a, a decision, a thing of the heart. So you can't see a man's heart, only God can. Mm -hmm. but, but if you look at Zacchaeus, uh, what's interesting about that story is this, is that in first century Jewish culture, you open your home, you open your heart. Yeah. So Jesus wasn't, wasn't hoodwinking or duping Zacchaeus. When he said, uh, hurry today, I must eat with you, what he was saying was this, will you give me your heart? So I believe salvation mm -hmm. happened up the tree um, before he even got home. Uh, well, when he got home, it was an act of repentance. And I see that in the in individuals I, I've led to Jesus, mm -hmm. that it's an act of, um, of responding to that invitation. Mm -hmm. But the repentance is outworked um, over time. But I believe a thing of the heart. And for myself, when I was uh, 15 years of age, I had an encounter with God mm -hmm. that brought me to my knees. Mm -hmm. The guy come up to me, I was crying. He come up to me, he said, do you want Jesus? Do you want to pray with me to accept Jesus? Now on the inside, I'm thinking, not really because you know, I want to be a rock star and all that sort of stuff. But, but I prayed with him anyway, yeah. because I thought, well, do you know, you know, something's happened. But on the inside, I knew it wasn't real. Now, for a few weeks, I was on the fence. I was crying, and I felt the Spirit of God. But when I was 24, it came from here, okay. uh, and it came from there, and, and that's when I was transformed. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm still slightly nervous that we're talking about a heart thing, because our Rwandan friends probably felt it in their hearts. You know, it's very difficult to judge a person's heart. So... There must be this outworking in lifestyle and repentance. But let's look at this, Tiffany. Um, what do you think? Does God spend his day crossing and uncrossing names in his book of life? Is that, is that how he spends his time? Is that how we're kind of figuring out who's in and who isn't? No, I mean, no, I don't think so. I mean, and that's certainly not something that we can figure out. It's, it's as we've said before, it's, it mm. is an issue of the heart. But I think that... You know, the Bible says that as far as the East is from the West, so our sins are removed. And so I don't think it, I think his heart is very much of mercy triumphing over judgment and and being able to see the, the heart and the relationship and, his, and, and showing us his kindness and his unconditional love that then brings us back to that place of repentance over and over and over again. And I think it is, it is a journey of repentance. Our salvation is recognizing his greatness and that fear of I want to be as close as I can to you and giving ourselves to him mm. more and more. I was talking to someone who was involved in making uh, the movie The Shack uh, recently. And uh, The Shack, as a film, you know, raises some really important questions. I, I encourage people to go and see it. I think it's a great evangelistic conversation starter mm. because, it, you know, what about suffering? Where is God in the middle of it all? Um, but a lot of people walked out of the screening feeling that the shack had said that actually everybody's saved. It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, wh whether you're a Hindu or a Christian or, or an atheist, in the end, mercy wins out, everybody gets saved. Um, that seems to be quite a politically correct, sorry about talking about politics, um, politically correct way to view things. Once you start saying there's some exclusivity about Christianity, we kind of rub people up the wrong way. What's your take on that? Is, is everybody saved or is there some exclusivity to the Christian faith? The um, Pew Research um, organisation recently surveyed American Christians and it was really interesting. It says that 65% of American Christians believe there are other ways to heaven other than Jesus. Right. Um, and that, that was a little concerning um, because there is that kind of message now, the prosperity, mercy message, everybody gets to heaven, all dogs go to heaven, as, as we've already commented, you know, it's a free pass. Um, and it, it's hard because, you know, for me, in, in John it does say, Jesus says, it is my Father's will that everybody who believes, mm. everyone who believes, looks at Jesus and believes, should have eternal life. Mm. But I think the church has packed up for a long time on this salvation moment and I think it plays into our humanity a little bit, like, oh, well, I have to have everything worked out in order to get to heaven, to be saved and stay saved. Mm. And I think there's a lot of confusion, uh, you know, and w maybe some misconceptions about actually what salvation actually is. Mm. Mm. Scott, you spend your days on the street trying to help people discover God. Um, is that a waste of time? Because everybody eventually gets to heaven anyway? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't believe, you know, Jesus would have gone through what he went through if uh, you know if we were all going to go to heaven yeah. uh, by simply by being good people or, yeah. or whatever it be you know the cross was barbaric and, and christ went through the cross 
uh, to, to bridge humanity back into relationship with the Father. So for me, you know, I think without Jesus, you know, I, I believe in his words that, that the only way to the Father is through the Son. And, mm. and um, I, th I think, you know, we need to hold on to that message. And, mm. uh, and I don't think, I think sometimes we can be a bit more PC with people mm. because we don't want to offend them. Uh, but what I've found is that people respect you when you're, you stand on, what, on your convictions mm. and, uh, mm. you know, you speak the truth, what you believe, you know. Mm. And, Andy, I guess we've seen the ugly side of that with, you know, Christians judging everybody else, looking down on everybody else, thinking we're somehow morally superior to everyone else and saying it's only us that are going mm. to heaven. Do you think the belief that Jesus is the only way to heaven is inherently arrogant? I do, I do think it's inherently arrogant. I think it's quoting Jesus, <laughs> he said. But, but the important thing when he quoted, he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And for somebody who comes from Northern Ireland, where there's a lot of people who are very, as Scott will tell you, who are very obsessed with, with truth and what God says. And so we're actually, we're a lot keener to know God's opinion. And we think we know God's opinion and we want to know God's opinion everything rather than knowing what God's priorities are. You know, for example, in Northern Ireland, where, you know, a divided nation, surely a big part of his heart is to see those people come together. But he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So he said, I'm not just, the like, truth is just not a correct set of facts to sign up to. It's found in a person. Truth is not just a set of correct facts to sign up to. It is found in a person. So it's actually possible, as you've been saying, it's possible to articulate correct fact, but if you do it in a way that Jesus wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. then it ceases to be truth, mm -hmm. which is a fairly profound thought, because yeah. he said, I am the way, I am the truth. Mm -hmm. Not that if you believe this set of 10 things, then you will be you know, in the truth. It's like the truth is it's found in a person, it's me. And so I think that's something we have to really hold like really strongly in our, in our public communication and in our relationships with people, that we're, we're pointing people towards a person rather than, you know, you've got to sign up to these 10 things. I would just say that, you know, Jesus is quite clear that there's going to be many that come to him and say, I did this in your name and that in your name, but depart from me, I knew you not. So yeah. I think that is one of the most specific um, things that he does say mm. about heaven. Mm. And it does indicate that there is the need for a very specific relationship with him. Okay, I, I think we can draw some really important threads here together because that passage you're referring to in Matthew, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? And Jesus will turn to them and say, away from me, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. And you think, hold on, you know, if you were looking for signs of salvation, you know, exercising demons and prophetic ministry, you'd think they would kind of figure quite highly on the, you know, definitely in the kingdom kind of qualifications. Um, because this isn't just mere kind of, I prayed a prayer when I was 10 before I, you know, went to secondary school. These are people who are active in ministry and yet Jesus says, no, you didn't know me. This is why it comes back to what I said earlier about functionality versus identity. Mm. Do you know what I see? Yeah, functionally, it looks like the right stuff is happening, but from an identity point of view, there's obviously been something lacking, mm. whether it's a motivational thing or whether somebody's just been in touch with some dark spiritual forces. Um, you know, that it, Jesus knows best as to whether we're connected with him and whether we're living to give him glory. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and, and Jesus says, by their fruit you shall know them. Right. It wasn't by their functionality, whether they're doing everything like casting okay. out the demons and healing the sick. That wasn't it. Well, it was fruit. I've been doing some research for a book I've just written called God is Stranger. And the, the, the key passage for me was Matthew 25. And this is his big talk about how you can know where you're saved. And he puts one side the sheep and the other side the goat. And to one side he says, you know, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. And those there go, we don't, we don't remember doing that. When, when do we see you, Jesus, and do that? And Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And then he turns to another group and he says, depart. And he uses pretty strong language, depart to eternal punishment. Because I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me in. And they say, we don't remember that. So that surprise that you talked about, that people who are doing prophetic and uh, exercised ministry, they're surprised they're not in. Mm. So the indicators are a transformed life. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not saying that you're saved by doing good things because that would be salvation by works and Jesus wouldn't have needed to die on the cross. But once you've started a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is transforming not just our thoughts, mm -hmm. not even just our emotions, but our actions. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we will start to look like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think, Andy, you've been saying some important things about this transformation it isn't just personal. It begins to impact the whole of society, doesn't it? So that one day, 
God will reconcile all things. How can we help a viewer that's watching this going, I might have more questions than I started with. Mm -hmm. How can we know we're saved? What, what gives you confidence when you look in the, the mirror in the morning and you're, you know, you're not looking your best, or you're not feeling your best? Mm -hmm. How can you know whether you are included into God's family or not? My first question would be, why is that the most important question to you? Well, and it is a question that Jesus it. seems to make us want to ask. That's the point of the parable, isn't yeah. it? Well, no, but the, why, why is that the first thing you're asking? You know, why, why, how, how do I know? How can I assure my sort of eternal salvation, how I'm, where I'm going to be for eternity? Yeah. Um, for me, that's putting the cart before the horse. Okay. Yeah. I, want, I want to glorify God in my life in the here and now. And yes, I do care about that perfect future, and I desperately want to be part of it. But I think if you're, if you're putting that first, um, I think that says something about your motivation. I, right. think, I think we talked about motivation, but that passage yeah. you talked about, depart from me, motivation is obviously important. And so I think we do need to be careful about our motivation. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I, I kind of disagree in a sense, because I, I think that is, uh, you know, I think it all begins there. Um, and, but what it com comes down to, I think, like Andy touched on it as well, is that is when you meet Jesus, uh, in all these topics we've discussed, it's all about meeting Jesus. When you meet him, um, you know, in terms of salvation comes from that relationship. Uh, and works come from that relationship. So, I mean, I know like, just an example is a, a young lad who, who's just been brought into staff in our church. I led him to Jesus two, two and a half years ago. He'd been smoking uh, drugs since he was 13. Every single day he met Jesus and he stopped. No drug counts and nothing like that. So ha I could look and say, well, hang on, maybe he's still doing this, he's still doing that, but he could stop taking drugs mm. after seven years or whatever. How? That wasn't through me. I didn't even tell him to stop taking drugs. But I, I think when you meet Jesus, I think something happens. But it was the reverse for me, because I'd met Jesus as a, at a young age. Now at 15, I absolutely renounced my faith in Jesus. In fact, if Jesus had been stood in front of me, I'd have swung for him. You know, because... Were you raised in a Christian home? Uh, I was, and there's something very unique about Christian brokenness, shall we say, because, you know, you're raised to believe all these things about Jesus, which if you're not then taught, how do you then marry that to, to, to everyday life, to tragedy and trauma and abuse or all of those things? You know, it's, it's, it's a tricky one because, I, you know, I wasn't interested in Jesus, although I knew him. Now, the question is, did I lose my salvation at the moment that I renounced him? Well, I'm not, I don't think that I did because in my venting and my swinging of my fists, I was doing it from a place of brokenness, of um, misunderstanding of who he actually is to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think God was offended by my venting. Mm -hmm. um, I think I absolutely believe and that there is an inner witness to that, that I never lost that salvation. I never, so I would have, you know, yeah. burnt in hell for what I said to him, you know. Let's give Tiffany an opportunity. What, what do you say to yourself to, to help you know uh, whether you belong to God or not? I think because w w what I was raised in, the, the question was always there that you don't know if you will be saved mm. because of these works. And it was always this fear thing of it wow. is narrow. And, yeah. and so when I met Jesus and I found out the reality yeah. of who he was, he yeah. was so real and God is so real to me. Yeah. I think I'm assured of my salvation because of how real God is in my life and my day-to-day -day, every day because of the relationship that I have with him on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. That's where I have my, my assurance from. It's not because I'm doing anything great for him. I've actually learned that it doesn't matter what I do, his love is still there. Yeah. Um, and, I want that, and that's what makes me want to do more for him. It's mm -hmm. an interesting cycle. Very helpful. Scott, you're helping people become Christians you know, on a weekly basis. You're, you're, you're meeting people that didn't know Jesus and then they become Jesus. If someone here is watching this and is saying, actually, I do want to become a Christian, how would they do that? Could, could you lead them in a prayer that yeah. might help them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I can explain, I have a, a picture here that just what I use on my phone, if I'm able to show that. And, and it's just a picture of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. Uh, and this is just a, a simple way of explaining the gospel uh, in, a, you know, in a, a condensed fashion, I guess, illustrative fashion. Now, the way, the way it works is that um, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. You have the handle. It's your choice to let him in. Uh, maybe you pray sometimes pray in emergencies, pray in a crisis situation. Praying is like talking through the door. You know he's there somewhere, but you don't know him personally. And what he desires to do is to know you in a personal level. Um, so let me ask you this question. If you had a rucksack on your back and we filled it with all of your sin, would it be a heavy bag? And that's your debt with God, and it stops you having a relationship with him, which is what he wants, like we talked about. He doesn't want your religion. 
Um, just like if you owed the bank, if you owed the bank £10,000 and I wrote you a cheque for ten grand, you went and cashed that cheque, what would happen? The bank would clear your debt, you'd be debt free. And what Jesus did on the cross, he wrote us all a cheque in his blood to cancel our debt. And he offers, every day he offers that cheque. And I believe that's what he did with Zacchaeus. He said, I, I've paid, I'm about, I'm about to pay for, uh, for what you, you've done. Um, that's what Jesus offers you today. He says, here's the check. Will you take it? Will you accept what I've already afforded for you? Um, so my question to you is this. If Jesus was in, in your living room right now, and if he said to you, I'm knocking, I'm here, will you give me your heart? What would your response be? Uh, if you would say yes to that, um, then I would like to pray uh, quickly for you to, uh, and, to en encounter the Holy Spirit in your living room right now, if that's okay. Just a brief prayer, would that be okay, yeah? So Holy Spirit, I just pray right now for those individuals at home, I pray that they would feel the touch of your presence. They would know that you're with them, that you're, you're universal, that you're everywhere and that you love them so much. Um, so I just pray that you'd, uh, they'd encounter your presence, change the atmosphere right now where they are. And if you felt that touch or if you have enough faith to believe that Jesus is here and you want to let him in, then I would like to pray for you. You know, the scriptures say, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. And if this is something that you want and you're willing to turn from the direction you're on and follow Jesus, then I would like to pray for you for that. So, uh, so here's a prayer. Again, it's not magic formula, but here's a prayer uh, from your heart that you can pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I open the door of my heart. I say sorry for my sins. I choose to follow you and make you the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I thank you today that I can call myself a Christian. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Scott. Um, maybe that was a prayer that was meaningful to you. Well, we'd love to hear from you. This is the beginning of a journey. Um, the, the point of becoming a Christian is not to have some kind of fire insurance against hell, but it's to start a new way of being, a new way of living in God's world as we look forward to the renewal of all things. So we'd love for you to contact us, to drop us an email, uh, tell us what you're thinking. If you've still got questions, we'd love to hear those too. For me, when I'm not sure uh, whether I am in a right relationship uh, with God or not, um, it's the words of a, of a very famous hymn writer that helped me. Uh, his name is John Newton, and he wrote a hymn that you'll know called Amazing Grace. And uh, John Newton, um, his early life included being part of a crew that was involved in slave trading. And uh, he was writing to someone who had a big worry in his life about whether he really was part of God's family. And uh, he said, how can I know? And John Newton said, well, look, I know I'm not what I ought to be. I still fall short of, of my standards, let alone God's standards. Um, I know I'm not what I'm going to be. One day God's going to completely restore me in my body. I won't, I won't have allergies to cats. I won't have um, brokenness in my body and I won't keep on sinning. So one day he's going to restore me. But as I look back, because of Jesus' intervention in my life, because of the work of the Holy Spirit, I'm not what I was, and that's by the grace of God. And so I would say to you, if you're not sure whether you are part of God's family, that is a little way that you could check. Has there been any sort of transformation in your life? Is your life anything more like Jesus than it was before? And if there's no difference, then maybe you need to start again. But if there is, then I think we say, praise the Lord, that he started a good work in me that he will complete one day. Thanks so much for listening. Please join us again on Questioning Christianity.